After the coffee break, Christian welcomes you to the next talk about security. Since 2003, the Open Web Application Security Project has curated a list of the top 10 security risks for web applications. In making the list, OWASP combines both a data-driven approach to find out current risks and a survey among practitioners to identify upcoming threats to web applications. Time to have a look at the latest edition to see what's new and what has changed and to get an up-to-date refresh on how to create secure web applications. We will also discuss whether the list is still relevant and what is missing. And unlike the list itself, we will focus on PHP. Christian, the stage is yours. Also, thank you, professional professional speaker, doing these these intros. I, I, I really love that. I mean, you know, when I'm back in the office uh, on, on Monday, I want this person kind of to announce me that, that kind of Christian is walking up the stairs. Christian is putting the, the, the key in the lock. Oh, I, I love it. I love it. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you again for, for being here. Um, I know it's A, late, and B, it's the final day, so, so uh, probably most of you are sitting on packed suitcases. Um, still, I think the next uh, hour, well, a little bit less since there's another, uh, Matthias is talking at six, uh, so I, I, I try to uh, finish a few minutes earlier so that he can set up, so that he can start on time, because again, it's late, but it will be worth your time, uh, pretty sure. Um, I have already been talking about um, web security in the previous slot, and I saw uh, many of you there already, and what I would like to do now is I would like to make, have a, a broader look at web application security. It's a super important topic. It's, I also would say it's not dry, uh, which makes it, I think, ideal for such a late time in the day. Um, so I've been doing web app security for quite a while, uh, and I've been doing PHP even longer than that. And um, a, a great way, at least in my opinion, to have a, a thorough look at many things relevant for, for web applications from a security point of view these days is uh, the OVASP top 10. We'll quickly have a look at what that is and how that is assembled. And I will use the OVASP top 10 basically as my agenda through web app security from a PHP perspective, because that top 10 is not PHP specific, but I'll have some PHP code. Um, so basically, that's, that's the idea. So let's uh, talk about the OVASP. Yeah, it's, it's a bit weird, right? A lot of white space on that page. Looks like it didn't fully load. No, no, that's, that's the OVASP site after the last um, uh, design refresh. The OVASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, it's a non-for-profit non organization. It's active worldwide. It has local meetings. Uh, it has regional meetings. Uh, it has worldwide, uh, just I think two years ago, worldwide uh, 24 hours uh, live uh, conference. Um, but apart from that, they do not only provide uh, conferences or meetings, they also provide lots of documentation. So for instance, cheat sheets against cross-site scripting, cheat sheets against SQL injection, um, verification standards for mobile applications, checklists when you do web application security audits. They provide software. So for instance, a web shop with security vulnerabilities built in and a scanner that can find security vulnerabilities, right? So you see the cycle there. Um, and the, the most prominent project they have is, uh, if you go here uh, on, on that, in the menu here, is the top entry. It's the OVASP top 10. Um, the OVASP top 10 is a, a list, a curated list of the top 10 security vulnerabilities for web applications. It was first created in 2003, then updated in 2004, and then they found out, ah, oh, this, this annual cadence, it's quite a lot of work getting that done. So they changed to a three-year cadence. So we've, we've all had math in school, right? 2004, so that's 2007, 2010, 2013, 2017, 2021. So three years cadence in most of the years. So we are now to kind of like four-year cadence. Um, but I mean, they're, they're good excuses for the two four-year cadences. Um, between 2013 and 2017, the leadership of the project changed late in the game after the first release candidate came out. Mm. And yeah, there was something in 2020, 2021 that kind of delayed the list. I, I don't even remember what that was. Um, 
And, uh, and so um, we have a list that's currently from 2021. The next list then is scheduled for 2024 or 2025. If I should take a bet, I would bet on 2025, truth be told, but we will see how that turns out. And at least in the latest, uh, last few editions, um, the list is very data driven. And I, I have to explain that to you because quite often, um, so, so recently I've, I've, uh, I've been at a project uh, where uh, I, was, I was asked on the first day, yeah, here, OVS top 10, have you heard of that? Um, please have a look at our application. Today you use number one in the top 10 and tomorrow you use number two in the top 10, you just look for those things. <laughs> yeah, may maybe that's possible, but th that's not how the list is uh, supposed, uh, supposed to work. It's an awareness document, and that's why it's the top 10 security risks and not top 10 security vulnerabilities. The vulnerability is there, but from the vulnerability you, ca uh, vulnerability, you can calculate a risk. So how easy is it, or how likely is it that that vulnerability is detected? How easy it is, is it to exploit it? And then basically you do the math, and then you have a risk. Um, and so it's an awareness list of the top risks. So the idea is not, if you have limited resources, use number three, but ignore number four. No, that's not the idea. But just to have a look at those 10 items in that list and then have a general understanding of what to watch out for when working on a modern web application because these are the threats out there. So basically, that's the idea. So how was that list uh, compiled? Um, the, the OVASP organization, or the OVASP Top 10 project, they asked practitioners um, to, to fill out a survey to basically give OVASP the results of their security audits. So auditors, companies doing audits, software doing audits, they were asked to compile the list. Um, I have here an older version of the data submitted for the previous, for the 2017 OVASP Top 10. In the 2021 top 10, you had to provide JSON, doesn't look that nice on screen, um, and previously you had to provide Excel. So uh, basically here we are. Um, so we have the CWE scheme, the uh, um, common weakness enumeration, similar to the CVE, which uh, you may have seen in the previous talks. Uh, a number is assigned uh, to each um, threat. So for instance, cross-site scripting, is uh, number 79, so it's a relatively old attack. Um, that's why it has a low number. And um, I don't know, uh, unchecked, uh, unchecked redirect would be 601. And then basically they had to provide, okay, how often was which issue found? And so for instance, here you see for cross-site scripting, numbers are pretty high. Uh, and uh, so here, 5,600 percent, okay? Yeah, so if it was found multiple times, so they both look at the absolute numbers and at the, the relative uh, incident rate, and then everything kind of was compiled. Now, you see that here are more than 10 entries, right? So if you just take the top 10 here, the list would be flawed because we ignore a lot of other common weaknesses. Um, and on, uh, on the other hand, Let's, let's say cross-site scripting. If you find cross-site scripting once in an application, it's very likely that you find it 100 times. So maybe the numbers could be inflated or not. Really depends on, on your stance. And so what the OVASP did was um, they looked at the incidence rate um, to, to kind of massage in the, the outliers. And they are also grouping CWEs so that most of these are uh, represented in the OVAS top 10 in one way or another. So for instance, the top entry in the 2021 OVAS top 10 consists of, uh, I believe, 35 or 36 CWEs. That's why it's a very broad uh, topic, uh, a broad, uh, broad uh, list item name um, with a lot of different details in them. And we'll have a look at those items and we'll have examples for most of them. Um, so the OVASP asked for these numbers, and again, uh, looked a bit. Uh, the format was a little bit different in the um, uh, in the 2020 for the 2021 list. And with that, they then, you know, did the math, incidence rates, uh, how severe is that, how high is the risk, uh, and they tried to calculate this based on experiences. And then they grouped this into eight items. And of course, the grouping is a little bit of bias in a way, right? Uh, that's why it's an awareness document. 
uh, even though it's so much data driven, but really it's about awareness. So eight items of that list were compiled that way. So what about the remaining two? The problem is that a security audit is always a look in the past because the audit was done in the past, obviously, um, uh, with past knowledge. Also, it was maybe auditing an application that was using old technology. So if there's new technology with new inherent risks that may not be covered by that, and if there are new developments, new threats being discovered, but those threats were not audited when those, those audits were done, that were then compiled for OWASP, um, that's maybe not represented in the list. So OWASP did a second survey, and the second survey they basically asked, hey, uh, please uh, tell us which risks will play a larger role in the future. And so people filled, filled that out, and the two top items there that were not otherwise reflected in those eight items coming from the data, they were also added to the list. So we have 10 items in the list. Two of them came from the survey. Eight of them uh, came from the actual raw data. And basically, that's, that's the idea. And so there's a specific top 10 page here on ovasp.org. It's ovasp.org slash top 10. And then basically, you have a couple of items here. And then if you click on one of those items, and I don't want to zoom in because we'll talk about those items anyway. Here at the end, you'll see the CWEs that make up that, uh, that item here. All right, and with that, let's have a look at the Overs top 10 of 2021. Number one is broken access control. Yeah, there are 35 different ways of how access control can be broken. Um, number two, cryptographic failures. Number three is injection. Number four is insecure design. Number five is security misconfiguration. Number six is vulnerable and outdated components. Number seven is identification and authentication failures. Oh, a lot of failure here. Sounds really aggressive, don't you think? Number eight, software and data integrity failures. Number nine, security logging and monitoring failures. And number 10 is server-side request forgery. Now, reflect that for a second or two. Think about uh, all of those items. Is there something unclear? Is there something missing? And I hope I can answer those questions while I proceed. So um, let's just dive right into number one, into broken access control. Two lists ago, in the 2013 edition, there were two individual items for that. One was called insecure direct object references. So basically, you could access data that you were not supposed to access to, I don't know, site.com slash index.php.back because I love using my uh, text editor from 1995. Um, or missing function level access control, that was the other item. So I could access features on the server, functions um, that I was not supposed to do. So for instance, whatever, you have an MVC system and uh, there, there's a secret URL giving you specific rights, for instance and you guess the secret URL because there's no authorization uh, as part of uh, calling, calling that thing. So essentially, you need access control for data and access control for functions. That's one of those things that, that sounds so simple in theory, right? Yeah, sure. I always do access control for data. I always do access control for functions. But I mean, there's, how does the saying go? Only in theory. Does it work in practice like in theory? And I think that's, that's, that's the issue there, right? Um, sounds simple, but there are some specific instances where it's maybe harder. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to showcase uh, three different, let's say, aspects of broken access control, three different risks or, or attacks. And we'll then uh, also talk, of course, about uh, countermeasures. And we'll also see that it's not always black and white. Uh, so sometimes uh, security vulnerability may be either intentional or is just accepted, uh, considered an acceptable risk. And I'd like to start with that. Um, so the, the older people in the room who have been using the internet for, for a long time, they may still remember a up and coming uh, sympathetic um, a social media service, like, let's call it that way. It, it was called Twitter. Um, I think now it's called something else. Um, and so Twitter, a while ago, 
was restricted to, I believe, 140 characters per, uh, per tweet, per message, per post. And then with some you know, marketing PR fanfare, uh, that limit was up to 280 characters. And in order to create some buzz, select people, VIPs, handsome people, and random people, some of them, got that new 280 character limit first. I was not among those. This gentleman was not among those, but he found out the following. If you go to Twitter, and now X, and you type in a tweet, as soon as you hit the threshold, and again, back then it was 140 or 160 characters, um, basically the, 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 the UI said, yeah, yeah that's, that's too long, and the uh, send that tweet button was deactivated. But of course, that was a client-side restriction. So he looked at the HTTP request that would be sent, and then he just did the HTTP request, but he sent exactly 280 characters. That tweet is 280 characters long, and it worked. And basically, he's saying that in that tweet. So Twitter was only checking that limit on the client, not on the server. That is broken access control. Now, of course, that's super, super embarrassing, right? Some people might say, hey, as if Elon had coded that himself. But no, I think it was an acceptable risk. I mean, I have no inside, inf uh, inside information about that, that incident. But I mean, if, if the platform prepares to increase the limit of a tweet to 280 characters and let's a uh, select group of users have that limit. I mean, if they have to change the database schema, they are probably changing it for everyone, right? They are just uh, um, restricting access to certain groups of people. And that's why I think it was considered an acceptable risk, right? When they wrote out the 280 characters for the first few users, probably the data scheme for all users was ready for 280 characters. But again, this just shows us that everything that is part of the HTTP request might be manipulated, may have been manipulated. Right? So nothing is trustworthy in the HTTP request. So in the PHP context, that means dollar underscore get, dollar underscore post, don't trust it. Dollar underscore server contains HTTP headers, don't trust them. They are part of the HTTP request, and the HTTP request is uh, initiated by the client, so not uh, uh, trustworthy. And if you're using dollars underscore request in PHP, I like to talk to you afterwards because this needs to change. Um, so this this is one typical example. There have been other examples as well, and sometimes great convenience that we get by, for instance, using a framework can lead to side effects. Here, here's a good example. This is an actual screenshot from GitHub from a while back. So you know, when you open up an issue on GitHub, um, it says, yeah, Christian opened this issue yesterday, right? Or for some projects three years ago, no one cared, right? You, we have all seen those things. This gentleman has opened a, um, an issue 1,001 years in the future. He's also referencing Futurama in that, in that post, you know, the, the animated series from the creators of The Simpsons. Um, so what happened there? Well, what, so uh, uh, GitHub was, uh, that part was uh, back then, maybe still is, implemented in Ruby on Rails. Um, but what happened here was, uh, Sometimes it's called model binding, sometimes it's called the active record pattern. So the idea is you have a model, and then you get an HTTP request, and then you convert the HTTP request into that model. I tried to replicate that with, um, with Laravel. So I'm, not, um, I, I'm uh, not using Laravel super often, right? So, so bear with me if uh, you would do some things differently. But of course, I did it in a way that there is a bug in there, okay? And if you're not using Laravel, no worries, I, I explain everything I've been done. So I created uh, a model for, similar to the GitHub one, right? Uh, for an issue, right? And so I thought, okay, you know, issue could have properties like a title, a description, and a creation date. But of course, the creation date needs to be set when I create that issue, right? First time I do this, uh, creation date is set, uh, so I just put that in the, um, in the constructor. And then I created a form um, where I add an issue to the system, so I have a field for the title. 
I have a field for the description. Um, yeah, and I don't have a field for the creation date, right? Because the creation date is set when the class is instantiated. And so I'm not, uh, I'm, uh, the, the form is only for part of my model class. The rest comes automatically, right? And then basically when I hit the button, I uh, do a post request to uh, the storing. And I don't even know, no, I, I don't even have the file open. But basically I'm then just um, in, in, my, in my controller class, I'm just getting uh, a type, uh, an instance of issue, right? And then I, uh, I'm using uh, Eloquent here as an OR mapper, and then I persist it in a database, right? And so the idea is that form request sends title equals something, description equals something, but I, on the server, I'm not working with those individual string values, but the automatism um, of the framework gives me an issue, an instance of issue. That's the model binding, or that's active record, right? Super convenient. So I can avoid writing that code that I've been writing much too often, much too long. Dollar $i equals new issue. Dollar $i dash greater than uh, description equals dollar underscore post of description. Dollar $i uh, uh, title uh, equals uh, dollar underscore post of title. I avoid this because it's convenient. But is it also good? I don't know. Um, let's have a look. So um, this should be the app. So let's go here. So I already created an issue. Um, and so if I add an issue, and I call this hello phpcon, welcome, 2023, I create the issue. Let's see whether it works. Then I created a new entry, a new issue, right? And today's state. But think about what's happening. Model binding. So every public property that's part of the HTTP request with the same name will be bound. I'm binding title, I'm binding description, but what happens if I bind creation date? That value will also be bound after the constructor has run. So I'm overriding a creation date. Now, to save some time, and you have seen that I already put a, a comment with the markup in there. Otherwise, you know, I would uh, probably need to uh, do the HTTP request manually. I mean, all, all fine and good, right? But it's it's just easier than uh, when I when I just uh, edit the HTML here in the browser. So I have a UI for that, right? But um, of course, I can do the HTTP request with Postman or whatever. So I'm doing again. Hello, PHPCon. Welcome, I don't know, 2024. I would like to see you all back next year. And then I think it was year, month, and then maybe one year in the future. And then this value is bound. So I've now created an issue in the future. And that's exactly how it worked against GitHub. And that attack is called mass assignment. It's sometimes also called over posting. I'm sending more data than expected because it is still part of the model. It can still be bound. The error I made here intentionally is basically that I said, yeah, and I mean, Laravel is doing that very well. You have to specifically say which values do I want to be bindable. And I add a creation date here, although I shouldn't. Right? And there's also a, a guarded property, which attributes are not mass assignable, right? So I could put creation date in there specifically to, to protect it. So both of those uh, 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 approaches uh, would have worked. Right? But it's easy to do. And of course, convenience here sometimes trumps security. What I generally recommend is work with view models. This form here to uh, create a new issue should have a view model with properties title and description, nothing more. And then on the back end, you instantiate a new issue. You assign the title and uh, description properties to that issue from that view model here. And then uh, the creation data is maybe applied automatically. Yeah, more code, but still, it's just, it's just better on so many levels. So that's mass assignment that's kind of hidden here in broken access control. And the third. Um, aspect that's also part of broken access control. It has been an individual entry in the OWASP top 10 for a couple of years, and now it's here part of that number one item, is cross-site request forgery. 
you know, very, very old attack. And the idea of cross-site request forgery is uh, you go to a website somehow, and then that website redirects you to a site where you're logged in. As part of that request, the cookies of that site where you're logged in are sent alongside the request, and therefore that other site that redirects you can do an HTTP request on your behalf. That's basically what cross-request forgery is doing, and um, I'm, I'm sure you're well aware uh, of that. However, I think cross-request forgery will decline in, uh, in importance, not because less applications will have cross-request forgery issues. No, it's harder to exploit it because all modern browsers um, support the same site flag for cookies. Same site is a stupid name. Uh, forgive me for, for the wording, but really a stupid name. It rather covers how cookies are treated by the browser when there is a cross-site request. So you go from site A to site B. If the same site flag is set to lax, then on those cross-site requests, so you are on site A in your browser, you are redirected to site B. On that HTTP request, of course, as it has been the case since 1994, all your cookies from site B are sent to site B so that you are recognized again. And with the setting lax, only those, uh, those cookies are only sent when you do a GET request or a HEAD request. So those requests that do not change the state of the application uh, from, a, from a REST principle point of view. For POST, PUT, DELETE, PATCH, those cookies are not sent. And this automatically prevents many, many cross site requests for forgery vectors from being exploited. There's also a same set mode called STRICT, Strict means those cookies are not sent. And there is also same side mode of none. None means no protection. Let's pretend it's 1994 again when cookies were invented, right? None, however, only works when we also have the secure flag to protect those cookies. Um, let me quickly, uh, quickly show you an example here. So I'm setting a couple of cookies here. And you see that I'm using same side legs, none, and strict. And so I'm working with localhost here. So I can access this, this script here using localhost, and then its name, and 127001. Um, but for the browser, these are different sites, right? So I can, I can try this out. So how about this? Um, I go to the, uh, to the browser. And then I go to same site writes.php. I'm setting a few cookies. Yeah, I know it's late. And then um, I read them out. And well, you see one, two, three, four. Four cookies, right? I can read them. Because whenever I talk to localhost, those cookies are sent as part of the request. But what happens if I'm at 127001 and then link to localhost? That's a cross-site request. Only three cookies. The strict cookie is gone, right? Because when we do lax and we do a get request, the cookie is sent. When we do strict, the cookie is not sent, right? And so just setting um, uh, the, the same side mode to strict, and if that doesn't work in your scenario, then at least to lax can help a great deal in preventing cross-site scripting exploitation. And you, you notice that we uh, spent quite a lot of time on this number one item because it's just so huge, right? Uh, there are so many things in them. Uh, the remainder will be a bit faster, but it was important for me to show you these super different aspects because also cross-site request forgery is a kind of broken access control. All right, number two, uh, cryptographic failures. That, of course, sounds like uh, high mathematics. Um, no, it does not. Um, of course, it means you should not use any weak cryptographic algorithms. So, no password hashing with MD5. But, I mean, in PHP we have the password hashing API. There is no reason of working with MD5 or SHA-1 or something like that. So, just use that. Use the built-in encryption once. Then you are safe in that area. And use HTTPS all over the place. All throughout, only HTTPS. So whatever, if you're using, I don't know, Apache, then use mod rewrites to redirect HTTP requests to HTTPS. Because then we have end-to-end -end encryption and then it's harder stealing cookies uh, at, at transport. 
and you can tighten that up even more. Let's start with cookies. Last bullet point on that slide, there's a secure flag for cookies, and it has been since 1994 when cookies were invented. A cookie with the secure flag is only sent if it's an HTTPS request, not via an HTTP request. So if you have, say, a session cookie you absolutely would like to protect, and you should, <laughs> for obvious reasons, use the secure flag, and it's practically impossible to steal it while it's being transported. There's one weak spot, though, not for that specific session cookie, but in general, the very, very first HTTP request before the redirect is always insecure. And there's something called strict transport security. Strict-transport-security is the name of the header. Actually, I can show you. Um, and so um, this is the HTTP header call. Strict transport security, you provide a duration. So I think this is two years. And whether it should also apply to subdomains. And with that, you tell the browser, next time you are talking to me, it's like children education. Next time you're talking to me, you talk HTTPS. Try it with your children. I don't know whether they will comply, but the browser will comply, okay? When you do that, the browser will remember that. So for the next two years, the browser will talk HTTPS. So even if I said HTTP colon slash slash phpconpl, the browser will do an HTTPS request. Once that strict transport security header has been sent, so now we have only one sole remaining insecure HTTP request left, and that's the very, very, very first one. I type in phpcon.pl. So the browser sends an HTTP request, right? Not quite. Some browsers, uh, including Chrome, they try an HTTPS request at first and see whether the, the website answers or not. But even better, all browsers come with a preload list, a list of domains where they will automatically assume that strict transport security is activated. You can put yourself on that list. You go to that site and then enter your uh, domain, I don't know, php.net. And um, php.net is not using HSTS, right? So we can't add them to that list, otherwise it would be dumb. Um, but you can do that for your domain. You have to, uh, you have, the, the details are on that page, right? So you have to, uh, have, there are specific uh, prerequisites that you need to meet, um, but then you can add your domain to that preload list. So with the next browser update, whatever, six, six weeks in the future, your domain comes preloaded here with Chrome and the other browsers, they sync their lists with the Chrome list, right? So my main domain, for instance, also uh, I've also added uh, to that list. So it's basically impossible to talk HTTP to it. Right? So it's a small thing, uh, but a big, big gain if uh, if you're doing that. All right. Uh, number three is injection. Ah, I know what it is. There are so many types of injections: LDAP injection, XPath injection. Who doesn't love XPath? Uh, I don't. Um, CSV injection. GraphQL injection, so the OWASP cheat sheet for GraphQL um, injection vulnerabilities is almost as long as the one for SQL injection. If you have GraphQL, good luck. Um, but of course, when we talk about injection, we talk about SQL injection or SQL injection. And you know, SQL injection has been the number one risk in all preceding OWASP top tens. And for the last few years, I, I just couldn't believe it. How, how is it even possible that we still have SQL injection? Everyone knows about defending against SQL injection. Every, really everybody. Also, more and more applications use OR mappers. You don't write any SQL anymore. How is that possible? And so OVAS always said, yeah, you know, uh, SQL injection is so bad, we have to move it further up. Uh -huh. And on the other hand, OVASP said that cross-site scripting, the, the topic of my previous talk, it, I mean, it happens a lot, but still, oh, it's not that important. Let's, let's, let's put that very, very far uh, down, down in the list. Turns out, now with the data-driven approach, SQL injection would have come in on number 10. So why is it now number three? What's going on here? Who massaged the numbers? Well, 
It's not called SQL injection, that item, it's called injection. And what is cross-site scripting? Well, technically, it's injecting HTML. So in this new list, cross-site scripting is part of the injection entry. If you read the list, and that's why I was asking, look at the list, is something missing? If you read the list and you read injection, cross-site scripting is the last thing you think about. I'm pretty sure about that. But it's part of that, right? And only thanks to cross-site scripting, this point moved from number 10 to number 3, right? All right. Both SQL injection and the other injections and cross-site scripting are relatively easy to defend against. SQL, I mean, we have the problem that an SQL string contains both commands and data. So if we are string concatenating with user payload, that payload is hopefully data, but it could be a command. So either use parameterized queries or prepared statements. Almost all database extensions in PHP support that. Those that don't then have escaping functions. Or you use an object, uh, OR mapper, because then you already distinguish between command and data, uh, commands and data. Um, and uh, do not send any SQL query. So it should be easy, easy to offend against that. And personally, in the audits I'm conducting, I super rarely find SQL injection anymore because of the reasons I stated. Everyone knows about that, and many people just don't use SQL, or many applications just don't use SQL. And for uh, cross-site scripting, um, I mean, the, the attack, if you haven't been in the previous session, the attack basically means that JavaScript or something else is injected often into server output, or it all happens in the client. And cross-site scripting has a lot of, uh, brings a lot of problems, phishing attacks, redirection, changing the DOM, um, and also this cross-site request forgery protection with the same site uh, flag for cookies doesn't work if we have cross-site scripting because then we can do requests on the same site. Right, so then we don't have any cross-site requests any longer, and the attack works uh, works much better from an attacker's point of view. And um, protection is easy, right? We just escape the five characters in an HTML context that have a, a special context switching meaning. We use HTML special chars in PHP um, or something else, but. It's important that we are in an HTML context. So I have a contrived example here, which I absolutely must show you. Um, if I hadn't closed it, of course. Oh, sorry for that. So we go here. Um, so I have here an, an application. And basically, I, I have an, an input field, Q. And then I take the value from that input field and I write it here in some JavaScript code, okay? And I'm, I'm calling HTML special chars with end underscore quotes, right? So I should be super safe. Let's see. Uh, oh no, this was the tab I wanted. So I can anything type anything in here, and then it's up there, and if I try script alert one, It's escaped and then written into the HTML. I beat cross-site scripting. Well, there's a problem. Um, so just to make make it clear, so this is this is uh, this is where the output is put, right? After running through HTML special chars, but that's not HTML. That's a JavaScript string. What is a special character in the JavaScript string? It's the same for PHP strings. So one of those two languages would be good enough. What's a special character within a PHP string that's not one of those five? It's the backslash. You know, in, in uh, what you can do in PHP. In, in JavaScript, one of the things you can do is backslash x as an escape sequence. Backslash x uh, uh, is a representation of a character based on its hex value. That's interesting. So I can't use angle, uh, angle, angle brackets here because they're escaped, but I could use the hex representation of an angle bracket. Uh, I happen to have ASCII-table.com open here. So let's look. Uh, oh, yeah, here. There's it. 3C is hex for opening and 3E for closing angle brackets. So backslash x 3C, backslash x 3E, ba uh. 
backslash x3c, backslash x3e, and we have cross-site scripting, right? Although we do HTML special class. So always escape in the current context. I have a simpler rule. Only escape with HTML special class in an HTML context. Do not use user payload in a JavaScript block or in CSS. Okay? Otherwise, even HTML special class is not good enough. All right, number four is insecure design. I have a problem with that. No, I don't have a problem with insecure design. Well, I have a problem with insecure design, but I also have a problem with the list item because it's not really actionable. I mean, what does that mean? What, what do I need to do? Make my design secure? It's, I know, that, that sounds too easy, right? And I, the, the idea here is, I mean, I hate this shift left term, right? Because it's a marketing buzzword, right? But use security as early as possible when creating software. Not in the end when you are testing it, at the beginning when you're designing it. And basically that's, that's what this point is. But nothing to show here, so let's move on to number five, security misconfiguration, a topic where for years I've said, I'm not an administrator, let, let the infrastructure team do that. Not, not, my, not my piece of cake, I, no. But I mean, we have DevOps, right? We have DevSecOps or SecDevOps, so I am a kind of administrator, not for everything, but for instance, those cookie flags we discussed, are they, they are a configuration, but should someone from the infrastructure team just arbitrarily send those cookie flags? No, of course not, because they, uh, they have influence on the application. So I have to send, do those things, and I have to clearly define who does what. I would say everything related to code and the configuration of the app itself and of, say, PHP, I should do that. Hardening the server operating system, okay, that, that's what the, the admin team could do. And, I mean, we've already seen a few browser security headers. We've seen the cookie flags. Uh, we briefly talked about content security policy in the previous session. Uh, I can mention it here again. It's an HTTP header which can uh, prevent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities from being exploited. So using those headers is pretty, pretty simple um, and just greatly improves the security posture of your application. So uh, here's a list of a uh, variety of security headers. We don't have time to go through all of them, but let's just pick one or two. Uh, referrer policy, for instance. There is the referrer HTTP header, which basically tells uh, the, the server as part of the HTTP request which document has been loaded in the browser when the current request was issued. But why should the server know that? I mean, sometimes it's practical for tracking, but it could also be a security issue. So for instance, when I tell you uh, the, the slides for today, they are on Christian's hacker website or something, um, and you put that link into your company intranet with a secret URL. When someone then clicks on that URL, the referrer header will contain the URL of your secret company intranet. The referrer policy can tell the browser to not send the referrer or to only send it for same site requests, for instance, right? So again, little effort, much to gain. And, and let's just pick one, one, one extra thing. How about uh, feature policy or permissions policy? So feature policy was first, and then there's permissions policy. Um, uh, basically, that's a header where you tell the browser which APIs JavaScript may use. So, may JavaScript use geolocation, may JavaScript use uh, Bluetooth, may JavaScript use web USB, something like that. Uh, and then you can kind of lock down the browser um, even more. All right. Um, there we are, sorry. Uh, number six. Vulnerable and outdated components. And that's one of those things that sounds so easy. Always update your packages. Yeah. And yes, I mean, seriously, every, this is a Windows machine here I use for traveling. Every second Tuesday in the month at 19 o'clock in the evening, our time zone, I go to Windows Update and install the updates that were released a minute before. But it can go wrong here, right? So if you run npm install every morning, or even worse, every night, uh, and then 
some packages maybe have been taken over by attackers. Or in another example, the uh, maintainer uh, of the package had some issues and then replaced his package with some malicious code or an infinite loop. Then you have a problem as well. And I mean, it's not easy. But it's an awareness thing. Just think about this. When you have a dependency, you're responsible for keeping that dependency up to date. And so, uh, I mean, uh, that's, uh, no, that's not what I want to show you. I wanted to show you, oh no, I closed, oh no, there it is. Um, so, previously you created a blank React app with, with that command. It's changed now, right? But when you did that, you got 58 vulnerabilities reported out of those several hundred packages and dependencies you install just for having a boilerplate uh, SPA framework. Don't worry, other frameworks had similar issues, right? But still, just look at that, and I mean, there, there are two of them are critical. They could not be exploited. But still, how does that look when the ISO auditor comes to your company, right, and then sees that? You are responsible for all of those packages. How many, oh yeah, 1,890 packages for SPA framework, right? You are responsible for that. So uh, the only advice I can give you is as much automated testing as, uh, as, as possible. Because that's the only way to find out whether new version of the package uh, still is compatible with your application, or vice versa. Again, sounds easy, but uh, in practice, oh well. Um, number seven is identification and authentif authentication failures, um, which was ranked higher in the past. Um, nowadays, it's, uh, it's a bit further down the list because most frameworks kind of take care of, you know, log in, log out, sane session defaults. Also, the PHP project has relatively sane session defaults. Um, because the main problem is HTTP is a stateless protocol. But again, frameworks often help you. What you just should prevent is session attacks. And one of the main aspects is to prevent that your session cookie can be stolen. We have seen how the session cookie can be protected at transfer. We're using the secure flag and we're using HTTP strict transport security. But what, at, what happens at rest when the session cookie is stored in the browser? It's a cookie, right? JavaScript sees that cookie. But if the cookie has the HTTP only flag, an invention by, you won't believe it, IE8, back in the days, <laughs> but all browsers support it, of course. If the HTTP only flag is set for the session cookie, and you can set it in PHP INI if you use PHP's session management, then JavaScript doesn't see that cookie. And that's why modern uh, single page applications are now uh, kind of moving back to, to session based uh, storage and uh, then manage their tokens on the server instead of using local storage for a token. Because if you have cross site scripting, the session cookie can't be stolen. But a token in local storage can because local storage is a JavaScript API, so you can't protect it, uh, protect it there, right? But in, 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 uh, in practice, identification, authentication issues are much less common than before. Number eight is software and data integrity failures. I mean, what does integrity mean? You make some assumptions, but you do not verify them. Um, there are a couple of ideas here. Uh, if you're using CD, CI, right? So continuous delivery, uh, continuous integration. Your code could be flawless, but maybe there's some malicious code running somewhere uh, in, in, in your pipeline, right? Um, one aspect that I find pretty interesting is the loading of JavaScript code. So we, we had some, in our demo we just had, right? Um, I was loading jQuery. And uh, you couldn't see that because it didn't scroll, but there was an extra attribute here, the integrity attribute. And it contained the SHA-256 hash of, well, the contents of that file. So if by any chance someone breaks into that CDN and replaces jQuery 371 min.js with malicious code, the SHA hash of that code would be different. So the browser would load it, calculate the hash, compare it to the integrity attribute, and then find out, oh, that doesn't match. I won't run that code. Right. 
And I know some, some companies are reluctant because they, they update those libraries very often and then always forget uh, updating the integrity attribute. But still, you, you just need to do this. And, if, and for, for the most popular um, framework, so for instance, Bootstrap, right? So if you go to Bootstrap, download Bootstrap, basically the HTML snippet they provide you for integrating the CSS and integrating the JavaScript, they all have the integrity attribute set, right? And there's a good reason why they do that. So use it as well. If possible, use it also internally if there's some, I don't know, trustworthy JavaScript code coming out of, I don't know, Webpack. When you reference it, use the integrity and therefore uh, validate the, uh, the integrity. All right. Um, number nine, security logging and monitoring failures. That's quick. Log and look at those logs. How hard can that be? Well, Maybe it's hard. Uh, a quick, quick show of hands. Uh, who of your private machine, right? I, I assume you have like a private laptop or a PC or something at home, right? Who has a backup of that? Show of hands. Who has done a restore? Okay. Because if your hand is not up any longer, you don't have a backup, right? It's like, like those, you know, uh, we, we have backups. Uh, but there, there's an error in creating those backups and we just never checked. And that's the problem with logging. I know more than one company that did excessive logging and the only security related effect of that was that their drive was full, right? You also have to check those logs, right? Otherwise, it's, it's not, it's not uh, worth it. But yeah, it, it could be useful. And then in the remaining minutes we have, there is still time for three minutes of ranting and then Mateusz uh, gets the stage for the final talk for today. And that is about number 10, server-side request forgery, an attack that, if looking at the data, wouldn't even have made the top 25. It's, it's a rather novel um, attack or risk, uh, and that ranked uh, on the number two spot in that extra survey uh, I told you about. I show you a diagram where I try to, uh, try to explain the, the steps necessary there. So we have three protagonists. We have an attacker, a client, that's me. We have a website that's, that I can reach as an attacker, and we have some other site I cannot reach. So I send some specific request to that website, and this prompts the website to talk to the whatever DMZ uh, website, right? So the site I'm attacking can reach the actual victim. I can not. So I don't know. Maybe I'm calling an API, and I know that this API is calling a a microservice here. Um, and that's the attack. And so the idea is maybe that request number two does something here which uh, which the website doesn't want. I don't know, shut it down, or the data that the second request receives is sent back to the victim and is then sent back to me as part of the application. So I may be able to access, I don't know, logs on that actual victim site. Yes, the stars have to be aligned perfectly in order for that to work. You see how many hand gestures I had to make when explaining this. Um, there are some really nice proofs of concepts uh, where, where this worked, but on the other hand, do you have many endpoints in your web application that then trigger an HTTP request to another system? And I mean, a GET request shouldn't do anything, so maybe a POST request? <sighs> and I mean, th there was a really good uh, session about new features in PHP 8.3, um, two sessions ago, two slots ago. And there were really some, some, some novelties where Probably many in the room, including myself, thought, oh, you know, when PHP 8.3 comes out next week, I'm, I'm using that feature right away in my code base. Why? Because I can. And maybe that's the same thing while uh, a lot of practitioners said, yeah, server-side request forgery will be more important in the future. Not necessarily because it will be more important, but rather because they know what it is and some people don't, so they say, yeah. I, because I can, I, I checked that box. So uh, I think this will also be part of broken access control in the next OWASP Top 10. All right, and with that, uh, I thank you so much for attending. Um, please uh, come forward for, for any questions. I'll just make room for Mateusz, um, who's uh, up next. 
And of course, uh, also on behalf of the organizers, um, thank you to the technician crew that uh, made, made us all shine here and make everything work really smoothly, um, which, which is not always the norm, right? So it worked really, really well here. So uh, thanks again uh, to the people in the back. Thanks uh, to you uh, for coming, a safe travel home. Stay, stay healthy and safe, and uh, hope to see you all again next year at this conference. Thank you very much. Thanks.